we get prepared to worship a few announcements that I'll make. Seems to be lots of energy in the church this morning, and uh, that's a good thing. God's Spirit is here. We want to find out who is here today, members or guests. Uh, we have a few pads in the inside aisle of every pew. We invite members and guests. You can take these few pads and write your name down. Give us your contact information and check the appropriate boxes. Then send it down so everybody has a chance to fill that on your pew. Uh, we would appreciate that. We do ask once it comes back to that first person, or to the last person, uh, if you uh, could send it back to where it got started. Uh, that would help our ushers. Uh, once it comes back to that first person, if you could tear out the page that we used today, uh, that will help our ushers collect those at the end of the service. Several things are listed and upcoming events and opportunities for the week there in your bulletin. I will highlight a couple of those. Uh, today is the deadline for our children's camp. We leave next Friday, uh, going down to Camp Canuga, uh, and paperwork and, and money is due today. Uh, see me if you, if you have any uh, questions about that. Also, two weeks from today, uh, we will be uh, recognizing all of our high school and post high school graduates. Uh, if if, you're, if you know somebody uh, that is graduating, we would like to recognize them. I just need their information in by uh, May 29th to make sure they are part of that service. Uh, we are, uh, we know youth activities tonight. Uh, we know youth activities. No evening activities at all um, because most of us will be recovering uh, from the dinner and a show. Uh, the youth have been. Uh, and the youth parents and volunteers put on an incredible show last night, an amazing dinner. Um, we have the, uh, the lunch version of that today. Uh, and so if you have bought a ticket, we're very excited about you being a part of that. Uh, we're going to ask everybody who's going to the show if you would just stay right in here and, and enjoy the comfortable views uh, for a few minutes after the service. And then I will come in and get you to make sure you get in line at the right time. So just enjoy uh, fellowship in here until I come to get you to dinner show. There are about 10 seats that are available. And we will put them up to the highest bid. Um, <laughs> they are 10 seats. They're $25 a piece. This is an event you do not want to miss. Uh, everybody last night left with a huge smile on their face. And but it was just an incredible time together. And I'm very grateful. For all the people who made it possible. We're looking forward to another time today. Let's see. All the other things there are listed. Just make sure you see the schedule on the back. We want to say a special welcome to our guests this morning. Uh, if you're a guest, uh, we have ushers that are coming down the aisles now. Uh, we want you, just right where you are, uh, to raise your hand. Uh, and the ushers will recognize you uh, and they will give you a packet of information. Inside this packet, you'll find a letter from our pastor welcoming you to our church. Also, uh, you'll find a uh, newsletter that tells you what's going on in the life of our church and a little bit of uh, the history, information uh, about the story of College Park. So thank you. And last night uh, was the culmination of, of a lot of work. I, I, when you expend a lot of energy and so many people were working so very hard, I was on the way home uh, last night and it just hit me how often words fail to describe how God has blessed me. Words are so inept, aren't they? About all the things that God has done and the people of God have done around us. And that's what I was struck with last night leaving dinner and show. Many times when I leave this place, Words fail to describe how good God is and all that He has done. But we should try to say thank you. We should try and give Him everything that we have in our worship, in our song. This morning, as we prepare for worship, let's prepare to give Him everything.
Our Father in heaven, we are overwhelmed by your presence, by your love, and by your grace. May we be reminded this and every day of all that you have done for us. The power of your presence surrounds us. And for that, we are thankful. May we give this time of worship to you. May it be about you. Come in this place, we pray. In Jesus' name. out with 
with us who walks beside us. Right? Now, but how do we how, how do we know that the Holy Spirit is beside us? I want to show you something. And I've got a simple glass here and some milk. Right? Does everybody like milk? Yeah. Okay. But so that's kind of like me and you. Okay? Actually, it's probably a little closer to me. I'm lighter than all. So, that's probably the point. But, this is what happens when the Holy Spirit comes into us. It's kind of like chocolate. You know what happens when we put chocolate in there? It becomes awesome. That's what I Cyrene. 
visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. May God add his blessing to the reading of this, this holy word. The poet and artist William Blake wrote these words in his book of Pentecost. Unless the eye catch fire, God will not be seen. Unless the ear catch fire, God will not be heard. Unless the tongue catch fire, God will not be named. Unless the heart catch fire, God will not be loved. Unless the mind catch fire, God will not be known. I don't know about y'all, there are some days when I think my flame, my flame needs a lot of fanning. And I have to pray anew, God, send your fire. We're going to do that this morning. If you will, join me in reading responsibly the prayer printed in your order of worship. I'll read the light print if you will join me in reading the dark. Our Lord and our God, our eyes are clouded by the world. We see people in pain. We watch the news and realize we're surrounded by hatred, evil, bitterness, and strife. We see injustice, and we lose hope. Spirit, send your fire that we may see the word in the world around us. God, the world is noisy. In the busyness of our day, we are bombarded by ideologies and arguments. We hear advertisements that tell us we can find our fulfillment in possessions. And we hear music which advertises cheap relationships and self-gratification. In the midst of all the noise, we struggle to know authentic joy and to live with self-control. Spirit, send your fire that we may hear and recognize the voice of the Father as he speaks to us. God, we live in a world where it's easier to say nothing than to be rebuked for speaking. It's easier to speak of your blessings in general terms than to declare your goodness by name. And so many that do speak your name who claim to speak for you fail to speak with gentleness and kindness. God, we fail to speak and we tarnish your name. Spirit, send your fire that we may boldly proclaim your name with boldness and God, our hearts are so easily distracted by other things. We place jobs, possessions, hobbies, desires, and other people before you. We lose our passion for you time and time again. We are not faithful. Spirit, send your fire that we may love the Father completely, that our hearts might burn in love for you. Help us to be faithful and steadfast. God, we fill our minds with things that are ungodly. We entertain ourselves with programs that do not honor you in your ways. We allow ourselves to harbor thoughts of ill will and prejudice against others. We scheme and we seek power and importance. Spirit, send your fire that we may know your will. Help us to dwell on things that are godly. Help your thoughts to become ours. And may our lives be filled with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Amen.
to you, so thankful for the gift of your spirit. So I'm so thankful to, to see that spirit shine in people around me. I'm thankful that I'm able to, to come to a place like this and to be with people who are filled with the spirit. I pray, and I know that we all pray that you will continue to help us as we find those times where we feel a little leak, that we can open ourselves up to your spirit. I thank you especially today, Lord, for, for our youth, for young people, and for the leadership, the parents that have given so selflessly and, and everything of their time and their efforts and energies to, to put on this uh, show, the dinner and show today, and the meaning behind that, the reason for that is the mission trip that will come up in the future. Thankful for the youth that will offer themselves up in ministry and missions for that time, for those that stand behind them, for all the congregation, people that support this action. I pray that you'll continue to, to bless our children and lead and guide us.
It is Pentecost Sunday. We've said that several times already. And Krista read the passage of Scripture that is traditionally read on Pentecost Sunday. Acts chapter 2, uh, the sending of the Spirit uh, and the effects thereof. And, and if you'll recall last fall, we talked about uh, for several weeks uh, in our church challenge, the result when people are Spirit-filled, when the church is Spirit-filled, what does that look like? And um, you can go back and read the rest of Acts chapter 2, and it will kind of refresh your memory. Uh, but this morning, as we gather in worship and as we read God's Word, I want to do something just a little bit different on Pentecost Sunday. Since we've read Acts chapter 2, we studied it a lot last fall, I wanted to go back just a little bit. Go back and hear what Jesus said about the sending of the Spirit. We know the Spirit was sent, but we want to hear what Jesus had to say about the sending, what that would be, how significant that would be. So our passage of Scripture, as we look at my way versus the Spirit's way, is John chapter 14. If you want to pick up your Bible, or if you didn't bring your Bible with you, there should be a few Bible close by to you there. And we'll be reading from John, John's Gospel, beginning in uh, verse 8 of chapter 14. You'll recall prior to this, Jesus tells them not to let their hearts be troubled and, and, and gives some words of comfort and assures them that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father through him. And then Philip goes on to say in verse 8, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. And Jesus answered Philip. He said, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I've been among you such a long time, anyone has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say to you are not just my own, rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing this work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or at least believe on the evidence of the miracles themselves. I tell you the truth. Anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. If you love me, you will obey what I command. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him. For he lives with you and will be in you. Then in verse 25, all this I have spoken while still with you. But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, who when the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything that I said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. Let's pray together. Gracious Father, we thank you for your word, the revelation of who you are, the revelation of who you desire for us to be as your children. God, we pray that we would open our hearts, our eyes, and our ears now as you teach us. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. There was a song that is popular, or was popular, by a fellow named Frank Sinatra, entitled My Way. And I, I will see much more recognition of that song title in this sermon than I did in the Mount Clark sermon. My, 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 okay. But if you know the song, you kind of know the gist of the song. You know, Frank is kind of kind of laying it out there. He, he's sharing some regrets. He's, he's sharing some sorrows. He's, he's talking about a time when he took on more than he could handle, a, a life that had its share of losses. But he claims at the end that he can stand tall, reflecting on his life because he did it. Wow. That, that's did it my way. He did it his way. So confidence in oneself is important. I get that. I understand that. Every parent wants to instill confidence and, and positive self-esteem in their child, right? I mean, we, we want to do that. You know, and, and my, the desire of all who guide us in life is that we would have positive self-esteem. And many of those who are lacking in self-confidence spent years reading books, attending seminars, uh, just, just to try to motivate themselves to have a little bit better self-esteem. There's all kinds of 
courses are one entitled Eight Steps to Self-Confidence, but there, I mean, there's lots of courses that, that are kind of a self-help movement uh, that are blossoming, interestingly enough, with all that's going on in our world. I mean, it is, it's, they're blossoming right now. But this is nothing new. Back in 500 BC, the Chinese scholar Sun Tzu said, you have to believe in yourself. You know, but this is not inwardly looking necessarily. American motivational writer Robert Collier said, your chances of success in any undertaking can always be measured by your belief in yourself. Seems a little selfish, but here's where it's going. E. e. Cummings wrote, once we believe in ourselves, we can risk curiosity, wonder, spontaneous delight, or any experience that reveals the human spirit. Of course, God is not left out because Benjamin Franklin interjected, God helps those who help themselves. I've had people tell me before, you know, it's in the Bible. It says, God helps those who help themselves. I say, no, it's not in there. Well, sure it is. I'm like, when you find that, you call it. Because I know Ben Franklin. Well, he must have been quoting scripture. No, no he wasn't. <laughs> he really wasn't. But, you know, there's something really interesting about all these approaches to self. You know, we, we know we know of the community style of life that was predominant in the past. It, it was about community because we needed each other. You know, people needed each other. Now, I would, I would dare say there's some of us here that don't even know our neighbor's name, let alone have helped your neighbor at some point along the way. It was a way of survival. People needed each other. You know, you may have been strong, but you needed others to live. Community was important above almost anything else. Today, individualism has become more than normal. Note the shift in emphasis in these magazine titles. Once upon a time, there was a, a magazine entitled Life. Then came People. Then came Self. Then came Me. We just went, went right to it. It's all about me. You know, there's a trend here from, from a broader look, you know, to more self-centered. It's all about me. And, and it's a little disturbing to me, you know, because we've arrived at this very strange oxymoron to be self-centered and to have an outlook on life. How, how do you balance that? One has to wonder about the difference between self-esteem and self-centeredness, between self-confidence and self-help. So it's really no wonder that we have a confused society in which we need to find ourselves by helping ourselves. And we have a popular media that, that does so well in taking this self business as a self help matter. You know, it, it sells. I mean, quite honestly, the better yourself sounds like a noble enough undertaking. So it sells to people. People want to know, you know, how can you find your way? Well, it's by doing your own thing. The message that the media wants us to understand is you don't have to learn things from teachers or mentors or parents. You can do it yourself. That's the message that we're being fed. You don't believe me? Watch these infomercials. Wow. <laughs> During off times, if you pop up on your screen and the little caption there says paid announcement or paid programming, just, just, just be ready. You can see about anything. And they're selling just about anything. You can buy equipment. That will help you build up your self-esteem by building up your body. You can get books. Books that will help you anything from, from a home makeover to a complete self-makeover. And, and if the things that you're seeing there on the TV are too complicated, they've got books to help you. The, the title of them is not really flattering, though. Uh, it's the, the Dummies Guide to, you know, to whatever it is, whatever subject you're looking for. The Dummies Guide to PC Computers. The dummies guys are working on your car. You know, you've got all these, and if those don't do, you've got videos on YouTube. You can type, I'm not kidding, you can go to YouTube and type how to, and then you're still in the rest. Chances are very good. There's a video there. Somebody has made a video there to show you how to do that. Whatever it is you want to do, somebody's made a video. And when you go to YouTube, do me a favor, kind of click on the church videos too. Ishmael to you, buddy. You're doing a great job up there. Ishmael videotapes our services. We put those on YouTube, and you can go and check out some of the services there too. A media gives you all the information you need about just about anything, including how, how you can make yourself better. 
the media of the Bible tells us a different story. It tells us some old stories which are just as relevant, maybe more relevant today than they ever have been. A long time before Easter, a long time before Pentecost, there were two events. You had the serpent in the garden placing in the minds of Adam and Eve, you will be like God, knowing good and evil. He tempted them with the fruit of the tree. He tempted them with the thing that God said, the one thing he said, you can enjoy everything else, but stay away from that tree for your own good. For your own good, stay away from that tree. But the serpent said, no, you can help yourself know good and evil. You can be free to make your own determination. God placed the tree in the center of the garden, and now you can place yourself in the center. That was the message. There was probably some, some hope for humankind as God, even though there was punishment, he continued to protect and to bless life. But we, we just could not escape our self-centeredness. And I say we because if we had been there, we would have probably done the same thing. If we hadn't thought of the idea, we probably would have followed along with it. In Genesis chapter 11, the people said, let us make a name for ourselves. And they proceeded to build the tower of death. Go back and read the story. Tower of Babel. And, and as I read that story again, a couple weeks ago, I saw the news. It, and, and maybe I'm overthinking it, I confess that perhaps I am. But, but I saw this story where they were taking the, the two sections of the spiral that was going up on the One World Trade Center. You know, the building that was completed, kind of a uh, remembrance of 9-11 and all of that. They built this huge building, and they had this spire that was 408 feet tall. And then they were putting it up on top of this building. And, and all the ceremony that, that, was, that was surrounding that. And it would raise the height of this building to 1776 feet. Now you get the significance of 1776, right? Please tell me yes. <laughs> Please tell me yes. And the reason I say that is I shared a story at 9 o'clock. You know, and dates are something sometimes that, that our people are not learning. Our children are not learning. I went to a store not far from here. I won't tell you the name of it. I went to the store, and as I was checking out, she said, your total is fourteen ninety-two. I said, that was a good year, wasn't it? <laughs> I said, fourteen ninety-two. That, that was a good year, wasn't it? <laughs> I said, do you, do you have any idea what happened in fourteen ninety-two? She didn't know it. <laughs> you know, Christopher Columbus may have sailed the ocean blue, but she didn't know it. So I recited it to her. You're 1490 Christopher Columbus, sail the ocean blue. <laughs> I said, you don't know who Christopher Columbus is? <laughs> Sad. Sad. I didn't dare throw the 1776 to her. <laughs> I didn't understand. We're not going to win on this deal. 1776. I get it. I understand it. I get the whole national pride. And I'm right there with it. I really am. I believe America is the greatest country in the world. And I believe that the reason it's the greatest country in the world is because it was founded on the principle of God's Word. That's what makes it great. And as we go further and further away from that, I, I'm, I'm frightened for the future. Because we've turned our back on the God who has given us these freedoms. <clears throat> And, and it really disturbs me. And so as I watched that, it was really mixed emotions. I thought, what a wonderful testament to national pride. But the other side of me was, was being a little bit scared that if, if the purpose of us building this and, and making this big deal about this building was to kind of thumb our nose at the rest of the world and say, we don't need you. We don't want you. You know, if, if it's all about us, if it's all about we, we don't need anything, we can pick ourselves up our boots. I mean, if it's that kind of complete self-reliance where we shut God out of the picture totally, then it's not a good thing. 
And we have to be careful. There, there's a balance there, I understand. We thank God for the country we live in. I, I wouldn't want to live anywhere else. But by the same token, we, we've got to teach our children. We have to teach the next generation. We have to teach our grandchildren what has made this country so great. It's not us. It's really not us. You know, there's a pattern in, in human life and we see it all through Scripture. But th just go back and read the Old Testament, the cycles that the kingdom of Israel and Judah, the cycles they went through, where they were all, you know, passionate about God, and then they would begin to slide away, and then God would send judgment, then they're all passionate about God again. And, and you go, well, how in the world can they go in that cycle? Well, look at your own life. Think how selfish we are. How self-centered we become. How self-reliant we have become. We don't need God. We got somebody that can handle that for us. We don't need God. We've replaced trusting God with self-help. Pride getting in the way of community. And when I say community, I'm talking about the community that we have with God the Father. The community we have with one another. Understanding that at the, at the base of that, the foundation of that, is our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ. Amen. That's what it's about. This side of Easter, this side of Pentecost, hopefully it's a different story. God has already entered the picture. He broke in in person. From the quiet village in Bethlehem to the crowds on the hillside of Galilee, from the individuals seeking healing to the masses seeking good works. The world has witnessed God with us. Emmanuel, God with us. On the cross, God suffered with us and died with us in our sins. Easter marks the beginning, the ultimate breaking in of God into our lives. Beginning, breaking in with the new life of the resurrection. And now with that resurrected life, we have a further realization of Emmanuel, God with us. We can read the New Testament. We can read what God did when he lived among us. When he walked and talked here on this earth. We can read about it. Furthermore, in Acts chapter 2, we, we read about how God is now realized in the spirit who remains with us. Who was sent with us to be with us. So self-centeredness now should be turned into life in Christ as we are sealed by that same Spirit and marked with the cross of Christ. Self-help should be turned into interdependent spirit of the Christian community. A community that joins together for worship. A community that joins together for service and ministry. All of this comes with a promise. As Jesus left his disciples, he left them with the promise that he would be with them through the Holy Spirit. And this was the power that would propel them to be witnesses. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, he says, You be, be my witnesses. Be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea, all Samaria, and to the very ends of the earth. He said he would be with us all. By his spirit. As opposed to the self-centeredness and self-help that came to the Garden of Eden and then moved on to the Tower of Babel. The spirit frees us to life and to unity with God and with one another. The spirit is with us. It's in us. The chocolate milk is a great illustration. <laughs> we want more. Let me taste it. If, if only we could get our children Hopefully we are. Get them that excited uh, about knowing God and knowing what he can do in their lives. You know, there's nothing wrong to believe in ourselves, but believe in yourself as one who is marked with the cross. That keeps it in perspective. And not just any cross, but the empty cross that frees you to be the one person, the, the person that God created you to be, unique, special, wonderful in his eyes. And to help us do that, God sent the Holy Spirit to empower us to live lives that glorify him. Glorify him. 
in the spirit. The paraclete. I gotta tell you the story. First time I heard that term paraclete, it's a Greek term. It's a Greek term that means called to one side. Para means the side. We're a parachurch organization. It's organizations that operate beside the church. But the first time I heard it was in in, in uh, Wingate Hall at Wake Forest when Dr. Charles Talbot made the statement something about the paraclete. And somebody beside me said paraclete. I went, mean, no, no, it's paraclete, paraclete. And, and, and the explanation in my mind, I've always visualized Cleet Johnson. Cleet Johnson was that guy in East Henderson High School that everybody knew had your back. He was a good old boy, good old country boy. And, and Cleet's not one of those names that parents typically name their children now. That's kind of an older name. But Cleet was, was old for his age. He always was. And you knew that Cleet had your back. Cleet was dependable. He was a good friend. He was always there for his friends. And so when I heard the term paraclete, you know, I, I, would, I would picture one of two things, either cleat beside me or a little bird with cleat's head on it. That was a little weird. So I tried to, I tried to stick with the, with the cleat beside me, you know. Paraclete walks beside me. The one that walks beside you who will not let you down, who's always got your back. The paraclete, the Holy Spirit, the one who walks beside us, God's glory at your side, offering comfort, offering encouragement, offering help, offering counsel, offering advocation. As believers, we are called to walk by the Spirit, by His power. We are also called to be there for one another. Para, beside. God walks beside us, so we should walk beside one another. Amen? Encouraging one another, lifting one another up, empowering one another. All the time remembering who it is we're here to serve. My prayer for you is that as we stand and sing, breathe on you, <coughs> Holy Spirit, breathe on you, you would understand what you're asking, God. That you would truly invite God's leadership in your life. Knowing, knowing from Scripture what that means. That as He empowers you, as He strengthens you, strengthens you, as He encourages you, that He also calls you to minister in His name. Let's stand and sing this song.
Take those words, Holy Spirit, breathe on me. Take my heart, cleanse every part. If, if there's something you're struggling with, if it's your relationship with Jesus Christ, uh, and, and you want to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, please feel free to call me here in the course of this week. I'd love to talk with you about that. If there's other parts of your life that, that you want prayer and, and, and help with, we'll, we'll do what we can. We'll pray together. We'll talk to God about it, and we'll work through those things. Uh, always feel free to call if you need help in that regard. Your relationship with Christ is the most important thing. So take those words of comfort and peace as you go. After Jeff has an announcement for us, after that we'll have the benediction. Following the benediction and the response, I encourage you, greet one another. Be a part of the community, okay? Take advantage of that time. Yeah. Just as a reminder, see, you can go from 007 to Duck Dynasty very, very well. <laughs> <laughs> we are excited about the dinner show, and we want to remind you, for those that are going to the show, we have a seat right where you are, and then we will come get you in just a few moments. Thank you very much. Let's pray together. Gracious Father, we thank you for this day, the joy of this day. Father, what you're doing through us. And we pray that as we go from this place that we would truly be witnesses that are empowered by your spirit to all the places that we go in life. And we'll ask for your help. And we'll always give you the glory. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.